Hello, my name is Helena Talia Payne. I have to read my notes to remind myself. Uh, <laughs> I should know this by now. I'm a member of the Quest Board and I welcome you to our presentation today. And uh, we're really delighted to have Jerry Hershey uh, as our presenter. And his title is Why I Paint and What I Paint and Why. Um, just a few housekeeping details you probably know. Don't park in the church parking lot, they'll tell you. I haven't seen it yet, but I heard it could happen. Um, the church actually uh, has those spaces that they rent out for a law firm and they get money for it. And just to remind you too that uh, two, four of our eight presentations request every series is made available at online. And they're recorded usually by Friday and they're like last week's are available. Now we don't record this one unfortunately or the one next door in the classroom, but all the ones that are occurring in the church or in the auditorium, they're recorded for your pleasure. So just, it's really nice to go back because sometimes you make choices, but you'd like to see two things and you're knowing that one of them might be recorded for you to see. Uh, we have 50 uh, minutes and the last 10 minutes will be for questions and, and Jerry's asked that we hold your questions for those last 10 minutes. But he may change his mind about that, but that's no. what I'm talking no. <laughs> Okay, all right, so now let me give you a little bit of background information about um, Mr. Hershey. Um, he was described by the Philadelphia Inquirer art critic Victoria Donahue as a distinguished abstract painter. Jerome Hershey is a full-time artist who has worked in his current studio overlooking Central Market since 1981 and actively painted for 52 years. His work has been the subject of 27 solo exhibitions including three at the Hershey's at the Lancaster Museum of Art with the fourth scheduled of May 2026. Um, Hershey's paintings are included in the permanent collections of the Columbus Museum, Columbus, Georgia, the Sheldon Museum of Art, Lincoln, Nebraska, State Museum of Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, PA, Southern Allegheny's Museum of Art, Loretta, Pennsylvania, Phillips Museum of Art, Franklin and Marshall College in, in Lancaster, Reading Public Museum in Reading, Pennsylvania, the DeMuth Museum, Lancaster Museum of Art, uh, and Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. So it's all, all over the place. Jerome studied painting at Tyler School of Art where he earned a BFA in 1972 and completed additional coursework at the Philadelphia College of Art in 1967, the Lake Placid Workshops in 75, and Millersville University 74-75. He lives in Lancaster with his wife, Shelley. Uh, they have two grown daughters and one grandchild. Let me introduce Mr. Hershey. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm really honored uh, to be asked to participate in Quest for Learning Lancaster, and uh, I'm really honored that so many of you took time out of your busy schedules to be here today. Good. Virtually every artist endeavors to create universal images that are personal. The sense of place in an artist's work may not be apparent, but it is very important about the creation and understanding of what he does. I grew up here in Lancaster County and was aware of Charles DeMuth and the fine folk art traditions we have here. I also enjoyed and sought out the rural beauty <clears throat> that is easy to take for granted. My current studio of 43 years overlooks Central Market and I am blessed to be able to admire the buildings of C. Emlyn Urban, James H. Warner, and others every day. And I should say, I grew up next to my Aunt Fee and Uncle Lawrence, and Francis Tucci ran the uh, art program for Lancaster City Schools for many years. And it was from her that I learned about Charles DeMuth. And other aunts, I had a lot of great aunts that were very interested in Pennsylvania German folk art. My Aunt Adele painted chests and collected things. Uh, other aunts and cousins collected 
Proctor and other illuminated writings and actually started the museum in Harleysville. And um, the Hubert Schrank, which you may know, the finest piece of Pennsylvania German furniture in the Philadelphia Art Museum was in my family. My mother played in it, or used to claim that she played in it as a child. <laughs> <laughs> so I come from this rich tapestry of people who made things, and my mother, as a sort of as a as a touchstone to all these hands that she had adored, would do stenciling and different things in the house. There are many artists that I admire. <clears throat> As a boy, I read Boy's Life magazine, saw Norman Rockwell illustrations. Later in high school, I discovered Michelangelo and almost simultaneously, Andrew Wyeth, who I met once, Barnett Newman and Matisse, who I never met. <laughs> At school in Philadelphia, I heard Chuck Close speak and was fascinated by his development. When he was a student, he was an abstract expressionist painter, believe it or not. And if you know his work, that might really surprise you. If you don't know his work, it's this. It's the portrait on the top left. Um, anyway, he was working away as an abstract expressionist. And if you know, they would like work on the painting, maybe smoke a cigarette, maybe flip it work on it some more, flip it again, that sort of thing. And they never really knew when it was finished. And he said that this was a concern for him and he didn't realize until he worked a summer in construction and he got to see what had to be done in the morning and do it and then what he had finished uh, by the end of the day. And he really liked that kind of process. And that led to these very large, these are oversized Portraits done with a single paint, single tube of paint, acrylic paint with an airbrush. He was a fascinating speaker and one of my favorite artists. The painting on the upper right is John Moore, who was the best teacher I had at Tyler in Philadelphia. His type of realism utilized sharp focus, things that were close by, so you might say near, and also things that were in the distance. So foreground and distance realism, near and far. And on the bottom is Jasper Johns on the left and Frank Stella on the right, two giants. They were huge when I was a kid and um, even bigger now. Light is critical and inspirational. In 1975, I spent the summer at the Lake Placid workshop in New York. The studios were open 24-7 and we would work all night, then watch the sun rise over the lake. I knew then that I wanted to strive to encapsulate the effect light has on water in my work. So, the two, those aren't sunrises, unfortunately, it's, it's tough for me to get a sunrise at our house. But those are sunsets, the one on the bottom is the Susquehanna River down here, where the Accomac used to be. And the one on the right is uh, probably in Lake Hawk Township. We tend to take drives around the sunset and look for good sunsets. The upper left is uh, James Terrell, one of my, another one of my favorite artists, along with Robert Irwin. And uh, James, this James Terrell installation at the Newman Hunt. You weren't allowed to take photographs, but I took that lying on my back. And the one on the bottom right is uh, Saint Chapelle, one of our favorite uh, stained glass situations in Paris in the world, but it's in Paris. Architecture of all kinds has also been a fascination. The Pantheon in Rome, I am Pies, East Wing in Washington, D.C., Frank Gehry's Foundation Louis Vuitton in Paris are all favorites. So you've probably all been to Rome and seen the Pantheon. Well, I lived there for a year, and I would go there in different situations, different precipitation situations, different times of the day. And to, it was my first sit, my first uh, experience with an oculus, the hole in the ceiling. And to see the light change and come through the room was really an uh, important epiphany for me. And in addition to that, the uh, you might say that the Pantheon led to the birth of the Renaissance because when Brunelleschi won the um, competition to design the dome at uh, the Duomo in, in Florence, the Santa Maria del Flore, he and his friend Donatello 
took a road trip down to Rome and studied the Pantheon and with what they learned of how they met, how they, the building was built back in Hadrian's time, they came back and in the 1430s designed and this cathedral was finished, one of the great domes of all time. Bottom left is I am Pi, bottom right is Frank Gehry, and the top is just a photograph I took down at the shore of some reflections in a neo-Victorian structure we were staying in, but I like that photograph. Mm -hmm. I discovered mosaic in earnest as a student in Italy in 1970-71. At St. Mark's in Venice, I stayed behind my art history class to watch a craftsman repair an intricate floor and was dazzled by the Roman mosaics throughout Italy and especially in Naples and Pompeii. So the two bottom, these are all screenshots, but the two bottom are from our Roman mosaics and the one on the top is Islamic. Unfortunately, we haven't made it to Northern Africa or Spain or any other places that have tremendous uh, Islamic art, but we will at some point. Okay, now we're rolling. This is Warren Rourke. Uh, this is Meridian, 1988, Oil on Canvas, 1964. Uh, 1988, 64 and a quarter square. Warren is one of my favorite artists and role models. I was fortunate to know him socially through our mutual friend, Dolly Chapman, and work with him on Philadelphia Elementalism, which I curated at Marion Art in 1984. A Lancaster County Mennonite, Warren came from a long line of farmers and ministers and chose to honor the land spiritually through his unique and personal style. I cannot say enough about Warren Rohr. Very important, a very good man, a wonderful artist. And from Lancaster. <laughs> so now this is me. <laughs> uh, over the past five decades, I've explored different ways to work with color and light and paint application. Along the way, I've referenced many things that we were going through. Birth, sickness, grief, optimism, hope, joy, persistence, and now the celebration of life. It's a lot for a short presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to begin this chit chat about 20 years ago. Um, my dad died in 2005, and I wanted to pay tribute to him somehow. He was a longtime Boy Scout leader, and I decided to create a body of work utilizing floor de leaves and square knots in transition. Uh, he was a master woodworker, and I learned, taught me the importance of tools and materials, so I choose, chose to paint many of these paintings on wood. So this is one of the stencils that I used, obviously a Boy Scout symbol, the Florida Lady, and uh, this is the kind of image that I was able to produce with that. Here's another one, this has five stencils, so you can see how I transitioned the floor to lead to the square knot, and then the kind of image that I made with that. And these are other studies about, what I tend to do is a lot of pretty small, relatively quick, for me quick is a week or a couple of days, um, studies, and then it gets more complicated. Usually they start black and white, and then, or in that case, blue, and then, a uh, little bit of color and then more complicated. So this is the first actual painting in this group. I call this Toward Tribute 1, 2006, 24 by 30. So you can see this is the floor de lis section and this is the square knot, knot, square knot section. Here's the one that was in the other slide. And this is the first of the actual major paintings, you might say, from this group. This is Tribute, 2006, 40 by 60, acrylic on birch plywood. This is in the collection of the York County Substance Abuse Treatment Center. So by now, I'm going in and out. You can see how it transitions, starts to transition back and forth. But again, still essentially black and white, although it's on wood. Now more color, this is uh, called Blue Tribute, which is 32 by 48, 
also in the same collection, the York County Substance Abuse Treatment Center. And now I'm hidden. This is early <laughs> spring 2007, 40 by 60, uh, in a terrific collection in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, a lovely town. <laughs> um, this is, uh, like I said, when I really start to get confident, the colors brighten. Uh, the, the flow in this is nearly perfect. This is one of my all-time favorite paintings. It's got a real um, velocity, and uh, I just love it. It's another one from that group. This is called Stella Aura, also 40 by 60 in a private collection in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, by this time I was gardening a lot and uh, I had discovered Stella Aura lilies. Doesn't take much. <laughs> Influences everywhere. There I am working, 2007. This is probably the best one in the group. This is called Aurora, it's four by eight feet on canvas. Um, it wants to go to a museum someday. I, I still have it, have been offered a lot of money for it, but I've never accepted the money. Uh, I wanted to go to the museum. And this is Mist. This is uh, 2008, 48 by 56. It's in the collection of uh, LGH and Medicine. It used to be an admittance but I believe now it might be in the executive offices. So if anybody <laughs> knows, anybody who sees it, let me know and, and make sure to tell them that it's hung properly and well <laughs> It never really was an admittance. <laughs> this, this is an important painting for a couple of reasons. It, it, um, in those days, I was bike riding a lot. I was commuting on a bicycle. We lived in Mountville, and I would ride get up early and ride from Mountville down through Manor Township to Rock Hill uh, or to Safe Harbor and then come back through Rock Hill and Millersville. So it was 26 miles each way. I was a lot fitter in those days. <laughs> and this one morning, uh, I really shouldn't have been there because it was really foggy and uh, I had flashing lights and safety clothing and everything, but uh, I was riding through this hollow in Manor Township, and it was so foggy that I really couldn't see anything. And uh, it was so bizarre, and I'm not religious, but I was reciting, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not out loud. And just then, a car came up from behind me and just grazed my jacket. It was the, the closest thing to a near-death experience I've ever experienced. Um, and so, I. I did this painting as the result of that. So you can see it goes from grays, and I always like to try to have optimism in the work, but so it goes grays, and then there's color on the right side. And the title is Mist, M-I-S-T, but it's still, uh, in addition, it has sort of a play on words with the, with the word M-I-S-S-E-D. <laughs> and also there's a, a nod to uh, Jackson Pollock's Lavender Mist, a, a great, transitional painting of his. Usually, I don't know when a series is finished, but I did in this case. This is uh, this was the last painting in the group. I called it Final Tribute. And I knew when I was working on it that it was the last thing that I was going to do, that I had, I had solved the problem, I had honored my father, I had dealt with my grief, and uh, I was ready to start something new. And I knew that I wanted to create work that was uh, stencil derived, but I didn't know what I would do. And I, I thought, well, I like words. I've never done paintings that had words in them. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not a particularly strong word guy, but I'd like to get better. So I thought that I would, I would do some word paintings after I finished this painting. So this is called Final Tribute from 2009. 24 by 48. I entered this painting in the, um, oh, it does work up there. Uh, I entered this painting in the show in Harrisburg, the uh, annual Art of the State show, which I've been in now quite a few times and won prizes several times. And uh, this year, uh, they were nice enough to give me a prize, or not nice enough, someone decided I earned a prize. 
And then they wanted the painting for the collection, so um, they didn't want to buy it, they wanted me to give it to them, which is <laughs> often the way it goes. And uh, I said, well, let me see what I can do. And I, I asked around, actually, I, we called Ann Barshinger and Ann's dear friend, and she said that she would love to give it to the museum. So Ann bought the painting and gave it to the museum. So it's in the collection of the State Museum in, of Pennsylvania and Harrisburg, gift of Ann B. Barshinger. Thank you, Ann. <laughs> so this is one of the early word paintings that I spoke of. Um, the idea wasn't that the painting be legible, but more that uh, by using, and I would, I would cut the stencils my, with my using my own handwriting, um, and try to create a kind of rhythm. So more like serendipitous, serendipitous rhythms of lines and colors in transition. And this is the word hope. The, the titles on all these are the word that's in the painting. And this was done around the time Mr. Obama uh, was running for president. Mm -hmm. There I am cutting a stencil. It turns out that <clears throat> if you do this kind of work and you use the size of a letter, then it might be the size that you think it should be, which maybe was this big at the time. And you did it straight across, they would just clog up. It, you wouldn't get anything that would look interesting. It would just look like terrible. And uh, so I made the stencils quite large. I brought along one, you can see it over there. And uh, the idea was I would, I would take the letters, like I said, it was my own handwriting in kind of a stylized calligraphy. And I would divide each letter into segments and then assign the color to each segment. And this is the kind of thing that I would get. So this is the word perseverance, one of my favorite words, also one of my favorite images made from a word because there's so many curved letters that you would get a really beautiful rhythmic uh, image. And that's how, like I said, how I used it with the uh, segments with different colors. There's another Perseverance painting. This is in a terrific collection in Lancaster, VA. And now we're at 2011. This is uh, a quote, this is Louis Pasteur, chance favors the prepared mind. And when I worked with words, quotes that had words like chance and serendipity, I would uh, try to create a ground to paint the words on that was more chancy. So you can see this is on a drip ground. It might look like Jackson Pollock or some, something like that to a lot of folks. But it's uh, just me playing around with drip ground and then the words are on top. This, this is the one that belongs to Cedar sinai in LA. <clears throat> so by now I'm hitting again. This is uh, <laughs> bright colors, titles a little cheeky, independent, interesting, and irresistible. <laughs> <laughs> and this is in a lovely collection in Lancaster. This is 2011, 32 by 48. I like this painting a lot too. This is a Gandhi quote, six line Gandhi quote. Your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits become your values, your values become your destiny. So I made the stencil for each line and had it come out from the center and then flipped it over and had it come out from the center going this way. So it creates essentially a symmetrical uh, and I did it so it would read like a mandala. So it's a very meditative painting. This is uh, 46 inches in diameter, and I kept this one. It's another mandala-related piece. This time the words go around in circles. This is uh, sports guy, Pat Riley. How many people know who Pat Riley is? <laughs> yes, yeah, I do. <laughs> Excellence is the ground to result of always striving to do better. So. I know that the first one is, is the word excellence. And the, the inner uh, circle is excellence, and I forget how the breakup goes after that. So this is uh, about 35 inches square, and it lives in Atlanta, Georgia. This is uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, What Could We Accomplish If We Knew We Could Not Fail? Uh, this was a result of a commission, and then I just continued making paintings because I really liked the, uh, liked the quote. I liked what I thought the idea of the quote was. So 
What could we accomplish if we knew we could not fail? Positive problem solving. Whenever we have a difficult problem, we break it into solvable units. So all the paintings in this group have one or another kind of grid. So the grid in this one graduates from a darker gray up to a lighter gray, and the six colors in the ground are repeated in different uh, order throughout the painting, and then the words are painted on top of that. So the, the painting, the colors are generally cheery, optimistic, and the graduation of the grid also speaks to optimism. That one is still available. This one is uh, now in the collection of St. Joseph's University. It's over at the uh, College of Health Science. Same idea, different colors, also 48 inches square on canvas. And this is the last one uh, in that group. This is um, both 48 inch square paintings, but they're meant to be seen together as one piece, which I do occasionally. They're identical in terms of structure, and obviously they're different in terms of color. So I, I was fascinated by how different they would read, might read, and then they did. And this lives in a private collection in Texas. It's another Perseverance painting, this one from 2015. Uh, this is 24 inches square. You can see by now the ground has a lot of brushwork. And uh, I would do the ground first and then paint the words on top. So this is more of this elaborate ground, these strokes. And, uh, and then a word is painted around this. So this is, the word is playing with a question mark. And uh, I did a lot of these paintings. Uh, it's a subset of the word series. And these combine, like I said, loose brushwork with the crisp lines of the stencil to create an image that seems simple, but is lush and complex. Um, the group touches both on the joy inherent in the artistic process and the generally held notion that art is not a serious profession to consider, thereby questioning where work and play intersect. Um, yeah, we can talk about this later, but the, the idea of, you know, people tend to think that we have a trust fund or uh, family money and don't realize that we're just a small business like anybody else. <laughs> There's another one. The circles are all 46 inches square. That's a beauty. You can see again, layers and layers, and then the word playing with a question mark around the outside. Another one. Same idea, different colors. Another one, same idea, different colors. This is from 2018, that's number 17. And then I decided that they were fine the way they were, that they didn't need any words on top. So I, I worked through the word problem, the word idea, and uh, was just making panels that had a variety of strokes and grid-based marks. And uh, these were very much an enjoyable experience. They were fun to do. And I did lots and lots of them. And then I started to attach them together. And uh, this is one that's 32 by 16. I kept this one. And then they got more complicated, a little bit more color, like in other groups. This, uh, how great decisions are made. This, this was a result of a commission from a dear friend who wanted something to cover the mechanicals in her hallway. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I'm doing these panels, and you know, we can move them around. And, so when I do a commission, I, I always do two pieces. So this was the first piece that I did for her. And this was the second piece. Mm -hmm. And she liked them both and kept both of them, which was nice. Mm -hmm. And then I was offered another commission for uh, a space in the Plow restaurant in, at the Marriott downtown. And they had a certain size, and I said, well, I'm doing these panel pieces. I can do it whatever size. Again, how great decisions are made. <laughs> and uh, they, typically when I do a commission, I, I don't really take much input, but I, I allow folks to tell me a color or two that they really like and a color or two they really hate. And this person wanted, this was, I worked with a um, designer in Atlanta, 
and uh, she wanted warm colors basically, so earthy colors. So I did this one and this one. This is the one that they took, mm -hmm. although it's no longer hanging there. I think Dale decided he wanted to hang a photograph where it was, so uh, Dale Hyde. So I have to find it and see what's going on with that. <laughs> And then when I finished that, I, I did one the way I wanted to. So this is my colors again. But you can see variations of mark making, uh, linear elements, uh, different things that create sort of uh, an implied narrative. So when, uh, like, I'd like to get this thing to work so that it, it's showing you what I'm talking about. But if you have um, areas that are speaking to each other or, or creating a kind of dialogue, that's what I was looking for. So not that it was obvious, but that you know the pink and red, uh, if some of it's an underpainting, some of it's an overpainting, that kind of thing. It's the same idea, only in those spaces in between. This is 42 inches square, and it's uh, in a collection in Lancaster, PA. And now we're up to 2020. So, uh, up in Lidditz, they call it the pause, I think, uh, the pandemic. And uh, the pandemic was great for me. I just went to work every day after Tom Wolf <laughs> said, you know, stay at home. I stayed at home for what, a week, I guess. And then Shelly would drop me off and I'd, I'd walk in, lock the door, and didn't see anybody all day. The phone never rang. It was great. I got a lot of work done. <laughs> and so I wanted to reference it by doing a painting that spoke to this this period of time. And I had already been using, I had um, revised the idea of all the strokes and was using straight lines, straight vertical lines. So all these lines are hand painted and layers and layers and layers of blacks and blues. And if you're going to create a painting that is speaking to the year 2020, it almost has to be black and blue. So it's black and blue painting. And you can see it's a little askew in the center. It does, the lines don't go straight across. Things are a little off. And by this time, I was thinking of these vertical painted strokes as like marking time. So uh, that's my Fields number 14, 2020, a portrait, 71 inches square. And then this one was started uh, a little bit before the presidential election of 2020. And uh, we were hoping for a big blue wave, so that's what this was going to be. But then it, when it seemed to be more of a current than a wave, I softened the colors and thought of it as a blue current. And then when Mr. Trump um, contested the election, I painted the red lines, the red <laughs> sort of sin waves across the top of it, something I never do, but I did in this case, and also 71 inches square, and this lives happily in a lovely collection in Willow Valley. And this is a shot of the studio. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have a spacious space downtown. I've had all these years, had five different landlords. <laughs> and uh, by this time, uh, vaccines were be becoming more readily available and uh, I changed the lines from vertical to diagonal and the colors uh, brightened and so this one is uh, Fields 19 from 2021. This is one of my favorite paintings in this group. It's about 48 inches square in a private collection in Lancaster. And this is probably the best one in the group. This is 22, also 71 inches square. You can see it's a lot more complicated. The colors are brighter. It's got a lot of movement, but still it, it creates different kinds of rhythms. And the longer you look at it, the more you see. And that's what I like in a painting. To me, a good painting should be compelling enough that it makes you enter a room. It makes you cross the room to look at it, but not so easily likable that you get it right away. There should be something about it that makes you think and wonder and guess and hope and brings out other emotions. And I think this is a successful one. In the book, which you will be given a copy of if you like, 
Uh, I talked, I wrote a little essay where I mentioned this painting, this one and Aurora. So by the end of 2021, I've been doing all these paintings and then I got sick. I was, um, I was getting tired a lot and I was having difficulty breathing and I, my doctor said I should go to see a cardiologist and I found out that I needed open heart surgery. So while I was convalescing at home, I set up a room that I could, someone said, uh, you know, you really gotta watch depression after open heart surgery. So I, I set this room up that I could do almost anything in. I could watch movies, I could listen to books, I could read books if my eyes were okay. I, and I got all these art supplies and I, I set out to do uh, as many drawings as I could. And so this is ink on um, gesso panel. And what I wanted to do, I hope to do with this group of work while I was uh, rehabilitating was um, convalescing. I, I wanted to try to figure out how to get from the straight grid in the fields paintings to something else, although I didn't know what it would be. And I found out that if I made the block smaller on the outside and larger on the inside and added this line, which is not in these paintings, that the image seemed to inhale. And then if I did the opposite and made the blocks large on the outside and smaller on the inside, it seemed to exhale. So I had this inhale-exhale situation that spoke to um, what I had been going through. I couldn't breathe for three weeks. And I thought, well, I didn't set out to do this, but it, it seems like this is what I should do. And I, I don't mess with stuff like that. So uh, I started to do in earnest a lot of drawings that spoke to this idea and tried variation, every variation I could think of in color and in scale, the different, different ways to break up the space. And this is the corner of the corner of that room that I worked in, which I uh, named the Bat Cave. <laughs> and our friend Matthew Lawrence, who's a really gifted artist, teaches at McCaskey. NEA recipient teaches at McCaskey, go figure. Uh, the only -E NEA recipient for fine arts, for visual arts in Lancaster County history, and he teaches at McCaskey. A good guy. Anyway, he did this this cool back cave sign for me. <laughs> so here I am back at work. This is the first one where I, I actually made the transition from the idea in the little drawings to the panels and acrylic paint. So this is called First Breath. It's about 48 inches square. Um, layers and layers of paint and uh, all hand done. And then the, the linear element is taped off and, and brushed in, so that's a crisp line. So there's a combination, again, of the crisp line from the taping and the hand brush line from uh, just using brushes. So another one, this is number two, same size. And after I'd done three of those, I started to do the double one. So this is a diptych, this is about four by eight feet. Inhale on the left side, exhale on the right side. The colors are a little tentative, but I really like this one. It has, the left side has a sort of an iridescence to it that I really like. And the right side, even though it's essentially black with color peeking through, has a nice graphic quality. <clears throat> this is the second one. This is in a, a nice private collection, also four by eight feet. This is the third one. This is in a collection of Prime Care Medical in uh, Harrisburg. It's a nice one. This is uh, number six. This is uh, about 28 by 56. You can see I changed the colors of the, uh, of the linear element and graduated them from blue to orange. And that is the same orange on the bottom left as it is on the top right and the same blue on the top left as it is on the bottom right. This is a Joseph Albers, two colors as one color problem, which I have used throughout my career. One of my favorite, uh, it's not really a gimmick, it's just a, an interesting fact, the way your eyes perceive color. So uh, you'll see that a lot in my work. If you, if you know that it's there, you, you can look for it. 
This floats happily in Manhattan. So this is the first one that's more complicated. So inhale, exhale, exhale, inhale. This one I call Green Rhythm from 2023. It's about 48 square. Uh, just variations, more variations. And by now I'm hitting again. This one is <laughs> almost like a circus wagon. It's so bright and colorful and rapid eye movement. Uh, it's nine panels, so it's inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale. Uh, I call this inner rhythm. This is 71 inches. Uh, inner rhythm is a celebration of life. Uh, the title refers to the movement within the image and by extension, the harmonious rhythms of a healthy body. It's also a nod to a comment Piet Mondrian made to Lee Krasner, a famous artist. Lee Krasner was married to Jackson Pollock. Piet Mondrian designed all the middle schools in the United States. Just kidding. <laughs> After seeing her painting for the first time, he said, strong inner rhythm, keep it up. And I often make a painting, I, I don't think ahead too far, but I often make a painting uh, in reaction to the previous painting. So really bright, blue, exactly the same structurally, exactly the same, but obviously totally different. The read is totally different because of the color use and the way the paint's been applied. And I love this one. This one is called Blue Rhythms, also 71 inches square. And this one is called Periphery. This is uh, about 24 by 142 inches. So it's about from here to the end of the table, the other end of the table. Um, I call this periphery because I was thinking a lot about uh, boundaries. And after two years since my surgery, I figured that I had uh, realized what I really could do and shouldn't try. And uh, to give you an example, without being too personal, uh, our wedding anniversary was soon after the operation. And I said to my cardiologist, so am I allowed to have a glass of champagne to celebrate our wedding anniversary? And he said, oh yeah, sure. And I took that to mean, hey, go for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I didn't drink for 10 months, but then after a while I just thought, well, it's just not big a deal. Even though most of the drugs that I take, most of the medications that I take said not to eat, include alcohol. Uh, but by this point, I had stopped drinking and again and, and haven't had anything to drink for six months. And I'm sleeping a lot better. <laughs> so that's periphery. And then this was taken a few days ago. This is in my studio. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about the possible future of democracy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was going to make this painting all black, but Mr. Biden's numbers seem to be going up in the polls. I know it's early, but this is the kind of stuff, you know, you, you're alone in a big room all day. Your mind just starts working. That's all I have. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer some questions. And you mentioned in your later work after your um, after your uh, surgery that you worked, you drew and worked with ink and acrylics. But the pre all, all the painting that you showed us in the beginning, you go, wow. I know. All the paintings that you showed us in the beginning. I was just wondering, what's the um, medium? Like, are they oil or are they all acrylic? Or and how do you how do you choose which one? Uh, everything that I've shown here today, everything is acrylics. Okay. Why do you always work in acrylics? Uh, acrylics dry quickly, and uh, I, I tend to work in many layers. I, I worked in oils for years, and my first version of this talk, this, this talk went through several variations, and I was going to try to do my whole history, and there, there were years of oil paintings. And there are, there are some catalogs up here. This is a catalog from um, the Lancaster Museum of Art, and all these are oil paintings. Well, these are small studies, so these are acrylic, acrylic and gouache, but all these others are oil paintings. 
And they're also layers, but um, in those I was thinking in terms of if you layer oil paint, you have a build-in reference to time spent because you have to wait for the paint to dry. Mm. So I, I was building up a surface and allowing bits of the surface to show through uh, as part of the design element. So I, I considered it to be a, a, a sort of a part of the story, but that, that's not important to me to, you know, more, more recently. John? Your presentation makes a good case to it for your painting career as being a kind of an ongoing autobiography. Yeah. And, and one of the pieces that I didn't see, which I love, is your uh, sequence of paintings of roses. Well, and, I know, and I know that has connections to your own life as well. Yeah, I, the roses, and there are some, there's some material about that, and there's some articles about that on the table. Uh, after, when I was going through this process of de deciding how to, what to present today, I, I realized that I've done lots of things about folks dying that were close to me. And uh, so when my best friend David Grumbach died, I tried to do a painting for each year that he was alive. And after my mother died, we had a rose connection and I did many, many paintings that had rose references and uh, in a whole lot of different ways. And then when my dad died, I did this other group. And it, you know, for me, I always say to people, you know, it's a way to work through everything. So when we, at one point we had gone out to uh, Northern California and we thought, you know, this is it, we're gonna, we're gonna move. We loved it there and we met some great people. And so I, my way of figuring out if we should stay or not was to do a series of paintings. And I did paintings of David and I having breakfast every morning at Zimmerman's restaurant. And, I mean, you wouldn't know unless I told you, but the, the <laughs> stripes in the painting were based on the stripes in Zimmerman's restaurant. And the clothing that Mr. Z would wear, those of you that are old Lancaster people might remember Mr. Z. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, the energy that takes place in a, in a, energy that happens at a specific place is something that I try to work with and, and helps me get through to the next, the next group. Um, you have a lot of geometry in your work. Is that all done visually, or is there any math involved with this? Uh, yeah, I get this kind of question a lot. It's a good question. I, you know, I, the closest I ever got to serious math was when I first got out of school, and I would mix my colors, mix my paint according to logarithmic uh, projections because it, you know, one to one, one to two, one to four, to get the correct graduation. Um, the, the geometry that I use now is pretty basic. I mean, I don't really, I don't, I don't really involve myself in the golden mean or uh, fractals or anything. I'm interested in it, but I'm, I wasn't a math guy in school. I just have an interest in geometry. Okay. And then just a quick follow-up for that. Um, when a lot of your paintings that have uh, linear progressions and, uh, and other you know, geometric aspects to it. Do you use any uh, like mechanic ways like drafting equipment to lay stuff out? Or is it all done visually? Well, I use rollers. Um, yeah, I use rollers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is it simple? <laughs> I mean, they're all, they're all done, uh, when I'm painting by hand, they're done, they're all painted by hand, but, but the area that it's within is, was originally drawn off, and I used tape to keep the paint in that area, if that makes sense. Yeah, just in passing, you mentioned that uh, there was some color theory or something that you use, like a transition you color from like one side to the other, yeah, that was referencing Joseph Albers, The Interaction of Color, uh, the book that I studied back in the 70s. And Joseph Albers and uh, Johannes Itten were two great colorists and uh, they utilized very similar, sometimes the same problem. 
and the interaction of color of, of Joseph Albers, who taught at Black Mountain and later at Yale, he was at the Bauhaus in, in Germany until the Nazis kicked him out. Uh, one of the great minds, and you may not know his work, or you may, but it did, the homage to the square was the work that he did. I taught at Yale for many years. <clears throat> anyway, uh, this idea of the, how a color reacts to the colors around it can change dramatically depending on how you orchestrate that situation. So you can make one color look as two, which is what that, that was. And, that, and I've used that many, many times. And I can show you, well, you look right here. This is, this is the same thing. So this is the same red. This is the same red. This is the same yellow. And these were oil paints probably done in, this is 1999. But throughout my career, I've done, that's one of my favorite color problems. So I, I do tend to work that in when I can, without it seeming obvious. I love your talk, thank you. Um, oh, thanks. I, I, since John mentioned autobiography, I'll just put this out there. When writers write, they don't have to give away their um, original creation, but I'm always curious about how artists feel about giving or selling, giving away or selling something that has meant something so much, like meant so much to them, or that, or that tr is a tribute to someone. How, how do you see that? And I know artists need to sell work to survive. But yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, uh, I used to try to keep something from every series, and I have been relatively successful at that. And now it's at the point where we don't, we don't have any room for things, <laughs> but uh, we get things for the kids. And uh, I'll go to an auction. I'm going, we're going to an auction tonight. We'll, we'll go to an auction and buy things back. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Um, but th the reality is, you know, you have to have enough dough to keep things going. So. Uh, you know, that's, that's just the way it is. I don't, I don't have any other, uh, what do they call it, cash stream. <laughs> so, gotta, gotta do it. And do it in a way, that's, that's the curious thing about being in art. I imagine poetry is similar. We could ask around. Uh, you know, you, you have this thing going on and it's really important to you and it's vital and uh, it's the most, you know, it's so meaningful, but at the same time, you have to pay the bills. So you, like I, I glanced or I mentioned, you know, we have the same deal going on at any small business, any any entrepreneur. Have, I had to learn how to do bookkeeping. I had to learn how to do a certain level of marketing without seeming like I'm doing marketing. <laughs> so, you know, I can't call people up and say, here it is, although I have done that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good opening for my question, which I was, wasn't sure I was going to ask, but how, I mean, clearly your work is involved and fantastic in multiple ways. How do you get the attention of uh, what you would consider a really good art museum to be aware of the breadth and length and depth of your work? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, now that I have this book, we're, we're fortunate to be able to, to make a book for my 40th anniversary and several dear friends helped, helped us fund it. One or two are here tonight, today. And uh, uh, so I didn't have to make money selling the books. And that's why I'm giving each of you a copy if you want one. Uh, it's, it's just a way to get the word out. But it's amazing how often like we'll mail it to a curator or a museum director or a, gallery director or anybody, and they won't even respond. They won't even say, I got the book. <laughs> so it's curious. And it's like everything else. If you know somebody, if you know somebody that's a giant donor, that's probably the best way to get in. Or somebody that needs a tax write-off that wants to give money. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? I have one little question. You said you're, <laughs> you, you're in this big room alone. Do you listen to music? Well, yeah, I do. I, I've gotten into, uh, since I have hearing aids, I, I listen to books in the morning, which I love on Audible. And uh, 
it, depending on what book I'm listening to and how well it's going, I'll, I'll listen to, continue to listen to it all day, but and then I'll often listen to the music. And believe it or not, I've really gotten into Taylor Swift. I love, <laughs> I love, I love Taylor Swift. I love her story. I love her. I love, I love the way she presents herself. I love the fact that she's from up the street and has written 400, 242 songs. And I'm not sure about the football player, but <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I still listen to Bob Dylan and the band and the Beatles and Pink Floyd, and all kinds of other stuff and classical music. I have, you know, the, the joy about music now is through Spotify or Apple Music, you can listen to anything in the world and you can tell Siri to cue it up, and it's <laughs> so great, it's so different than it used to be. When you have your I know some of you might need to catch a bus, got the books here, then... Yeah, please take a book, and if you don't want one, you can